And so Vortigern goes to his uh, counselors and asks them, what should we do? And they tell him, well, what we need to do is find a child without father. And then we need to kill him and sprinkle his blood around a bit, and that'll take care of things. So, interesting. A child without earthly father, we sacrifice him, and his blood, well, that takes care of the problem. We've heard that story before, too. But a reflection, you see. The Merlin myth, a reflection. Hmm. Well, Marilyn comes. He avoids being sacrificed. He confronts the king and tells him that I will disclose to you what the problem is, if you wish. And he tells him the story. The problem, you see, is that this noble tower the king is trying to build has foundation laid upon a ground under which struggle two dragons, a red dragon and a white dragon dragon. And every time they feel the weight of the castle building on their backs, they start shrugging and struggling. And then the castle falls down. So Marilyn says, if you want to take care of this, what you need to do is drain the lake underneath here. Find the dragons. The dragons will then themselves fight. And Marilyn says, I will not read here. Marilyn, Marilyn tells him that, uh, that in their battle, in the battle of the red and the white dragon, there is great significance, a conflict of opposites, an attempt to build a structure on unstable ground, made unstable by the lack of realization that underneath, in the waters, there are struggling two forces, red and white, light and dark. Hmm. Merlin becomes the prophet in the Arthurian legends of the Grail. Prophet. Vi. Vis. Seer. Seer. Visit. Seer of the Grail. And this is a, a role we frequently find of the wizard, particularly this archetypal, this first wizard of the West. He is a helper in the quest to find this most magical and transformative object. Now, he cannot rule how the quest will end, but he can aid on the journey with his vision. And then there's the ending of Marilyn. It involves a maid, a maiden, by the name of Nimiane, or Nineveh. In some recensions of the myth, Nineveh, or Nimiana, is seen sort of as a witch, as an evil force, but she's not that at all in the story, as once told. Marilyn, in his journeys, comes to a well, and he meets there a young girl, perhaps 12 years of age, and he is entranced by her. He falls actually in love with her. And to amuse her, perhaps impress her a bit, I mean, he's a wizard, why not? Uh, he calls forth a tower. He says, uh, let, let, let me show you something, Missy. <laughs> and so he goes over. And with his staff, he makes a circle on the earth three times. And does his calls, and there a great tower grows. And then from the forest, there come squires and damsels singing and dancing. And they come, and they make quite a racket of amusements. A big party, which they say can be heard for miles away. And of course, the young girl is, well, duly impressed. And in fact, so impressed that what she says is, quoth she, teach me so to do. Learn me so to do. Hey, that's a neat trick. You know what? I'd like to learn how to do that myself. And Marilyn decides, Marilyn decides that he will teach her. Quoth Marilyn, be then a clerk, he asks her. Are you a clerk? Are you a scholar? Do you understand how to read and write? Well, yes, she is. Yes, she is. 
She's an intelligent woman. She reads. She writes. She quests after understanding. She is also, we should add, the daughter of a king, a noble woman. Well, the story goes on and over many years, Marilyn teaches her. He falls in love with her. Their love becomes full in every sense. And she learns his arts. But there's one thing that she wants more to know. She wants to know how to make a tower, like he did to start. Then, depart, then departed Mer Merlin, and in little space come to his love, that great joy of him made and he of her, and dwelt together long time, and ever she inquired of his crafts, and he her taught and learned so much, that after he was holden a fool, and yet is, they thought he was a fool for teaching her. It was his own downfall. And she them well understood, and put them in the writing, as she that was well expert in the seven arts. She was an expert in the seven arts, a learned woman. And when he had her taught all that she could ask, she bethought her how she might him withhold forever. She wanted to bind herself, in a sense, to Marilyn. Sir, yet can I not own thing that I would fain learn, and therefore I pray you that ye would me inform. And Merlin, that well knew her intent, said, Malam, what thing is that? Sir, quoth she, I would fain learn how I might one sot in a tower, without in walls or without in any closure, by enchantment, so that he should go out without in my license. That he should ne'er go out without in my license. She asks him, how do I build a tower that I can imprison somebody in within walls so that he can't leave? Marilyn knows exactly what's going on, but he teaches her. And so one day they go out into the forest deep into the forest. They find a hawthorn bush in flower and lay themselves down. Marilyn rests his head in her lap and falls asleep. Gently she arises. And when she felt that he was on sleep, she arose softly and made a cern in your tongue, a circle, a cern. With her wimple, scarf, you say, with her wimple, and all about the bush, and all about Merlin, and began her enchantments, such as Merlin had here taught. And she made the ser nine times, and nine times her enchantments, and held him there till he did awake. And when he looked about him, and him seemed, he was in the fairest tower of the world, and the most strong, and found him laid in the fairest place that ever he lay before him. So Merlin was there in the tower, laying with his love. And so it was forever. He was encaptured. She, she could go out. She who he had taught, she could come back. He there rested. And it is said that in the deep ancient forests, one can yet to this day hear the cry of Merlin from that tower, the wizard, the archetypal wizard. Well, I could say more about that particular story of his capture, the young woman. You know, the, these are imaginational creations. They are not allegories. 
They weren't meant to image some external reality point for point as a morally instructive story. They're primary creations of the imagination, like dreams, medieval dreams. And perhaps, perhaps those dreams have meaning. Perhaps even they have prophetic intent. Perhaps the young woman is a bit like the Western soul itself, arising from the mists of medieval time, trained by a vision, a wizard in the arts of creation. The wizard himself, the one with primary vision, 